Good morning and happy Sunday. So welcome to another Sunday of Church Online. And for those of you who joined us last week, you will have been there for our first week of our new theme, We Haven't Been This Way Before. And last week we were asking that question of how do we navigate the journey ahead when we haven't been this way before? And we spoke about uh, the necessity of God's word, having a reliance on God's word as the very foundation upon which we build our lives. But not just on his word, but also having a dependence upon his Holy Spirit, who is our own personal guide as we travel through life into the unknown on a journey that no one else is going on the same path as us. And so it's so, so foundational in this journey where we haven't been this way before, that we have a dependence upon God's word and a reliance upon his Holy Spirit. And so today we're going to continue this journey of, and we haven't been this way before, looking at what it means to trust in God. Uh, Before we go any further, though, I am going to pray. So Father God, we just, we honor you today. I thank you, Father God, for the truth that is found in your word. I thank you, Lord, that it is your spirit that guides us and speaks directly to us. And so Father God, today, I just ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to each one of us directly speaking into those areas of life, Lord, that we need to hear your word and your guiding and your leading at this time. God, that you would give us ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that believe what you're saying to us today. We thank you, God. We honor you today. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to do your work in our hearts and our lives today. We pray this in Jesus' mighty and powerful name. Amen. Awesome. All right, so today we're going to be starting with a very well-known but sometimes misunderstood story in the Bible. And you'll find this story in the very first chapter of your Bibles in the book of Genesis in chapter 1. And depending on what your translation is, you might read the words that say, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, before we learn anything else about God, we learn and we discover that he is the author and the creator of, um, of life and he fashions this world so complexly and so beautifully and so wonderfully. He brings light to darkness and life where it was empty and formless. He designs and creates everything that we see and know, everything from the smallest molecule and insect to the great and beautiful landscapes that we know in our country and around the world, rainforests, massive big deserts, herds of animals and galaxies and stars that we don't even know exists. He creates it all. And when he does, he says that everything is good. But then he does his final masterpiece and he creates man and woman in his own image. He creates them in his image and he breathes his life into them. And at this point, he says that it is very good and he rests from his work. He then walks with them in this garden and gives them complete freedom to enjoy everything that he has created for them. He teaches them and shows them how to operate and how to work in this world so that it would flourish. He gives them important roles and work to do to look after and care for this world that he has created. And he doesn't do it by just creating mankind and plumping them in a garden and then leaving them to their own devices, but that he creates them to be in community with him, to partner with him in, in bringing this world into the completeness that God had designed for it. And there is this community between mankind and God where there is no shame or guilt or fear. There is no distance within these relationships. And he gives them this complete and absolute freedom. But we know that in order for there to be true freedom, there also needs to be choice. And within this perfect and good, good, um, good garden that God creates, this good and perfect world, he puts one boundary in the form of a tree. And he says in Genesis 2, 16, says, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. Notice that this command comes from a place of freedom. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And instead of looking at this incredible freedom that they had, they looked at the one boundary. There's this one tree that contains fruit and it looks good and it sounds good. Knowledge of good and evil, but it's deceptive. And God warns them, don't touch this fruit. Do not eat of the fruit, for in it, it contains death. 
but they're drawn to this forbidden tree. And at this tree, they meet a creature who is cunning and deceptive. And, and he starts to ask them, did God really say that you can't eat or touch the fruit? And Eve first begins to question God's goodness. Is God holding out on me? Why would God stop me from eating this fruit? It looks good. It sounds good. What's God not telling me? Why wouldn't he give me this good fruit? And she begins to listen to the lies. And in Genesis 3, 4 to 5, the serpent, who is this creature, this evil creature that deceives them, he says, you will not certainly die, starts to, starts to um, tell lies about what God has really said. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, no longer will you be reliant on God to tell you what is good and evil. You won't need him to lead you or teach you your ways. In fact, you will become your own God. See, Eve forgets who she is. She is already being created in God's image. She is already like God. But she starts to believe these lies and her beliefs lead to action. And so she makes this choice to eat the fruit. And it's a moment of rebellion against God, um, where she's wanting to choose right and wrong for herself. And in this moment of autonomy, where she doesn't want to rely on God anymore, she seizes this, this desire for control. And she is not alone in this. The Bible says that Adam was with her and he too ate of the fruit. And the sad reality came after that in Genesis 3 verse 7. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked. In this one moment, with one choice, as they believe the lie, they lose their innocence. God had not lied to them. In that choice, there was death. Now, we were never created to manage this world or to live in this world without God. For only God, the one who created and authored the whole thing, understands the full complexities of it all. Only God can understand how everything weaves together like threads in a tapestry. Pull one thread and watch the whole thing unravel. But God, who is the one that created and designed and authored it, he knows how to live in this good and perfect world. And yet Adam and Eve decided they wanted to do it without God. That they would seize that autonomy and they would define right and wrong for themselves. And from this moment, we see this spiral of sin and the way that it corrupts everything that it touches. First, it corrupts this relationship, this connection between mankind and God, where they used to walk freely in the garden with him. Now they feel shame and they run and they hide from him when they hear his voice. They then begin to blame each other. There is a breakdown in their own connection. They were designed to work together, to partner together, together with each other and with God to fulfill the purpose within this world. But now they're blaming each other. Where there was freedom, there is now shame and guilt and blame. Where there was community, there is now disconnect, there is rejection, separation, hurt, anger. And where there was once flourishing, there is now labor and toil and suffering and pain and hardship. See, this story at the very beginning of the Bible is so fundamental to the Christian faith. First and foremost, it gives us an understanding about who God is. He is the author and creator, the sustainer of all things. It also tells us who we are within the story. We are created in God's image, created to do good works on this earth, not on our own and not in our own means, but in partnership with God, the one who created and sustains it all. It also teaches us that God is not the author of evil, but rather evil comes, evil and sin comes when we reject God's way of doing things and decide that we're going to do it in our own way, our own terms, our own means, and through what seems right to us. It's this lack of trust that God does know what is best for the world and the people that he created. And it warns us about falling into the same trap. Those same lies of not trusting God. Did God really say, what is God holding out on me for? It looks good. Why would God say no to that? Am I really created in God's image? 
These are the same lies that our generation faces so many years later and so many generations that have gone before us. And the story continues in the way that sin corrupts our entire world and even our entire nature. Time and time again, we continue to rebel against our creator, wanting that control, that autonomy from our, for ourselves. We struggle and fight against one another. Just turn on the news, scroll through Facebook. We're still struggling for that control, for that power. And as you read through the rest of the book of Genesis, it goes through the stories of murder and war, of adultery and cruelty and oppression. And my heart breaks as I think of Father God, as I think about his heart, as he looks upon this creation that was once good and sees what we have done with it, thinking that we knew better. There's this story in uh, the Gospel of Luke in chapter 19 where Jesus is riding into Jerusalem for the very final time. And as he, it says um, in verse 41, it says, As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. God himself weeping over his creation as he rides into the city where he is going to face firsthand the absolute and full brunt of human cruelty and injustice. Where Jesus takes on the sin and the corruption of the world and faces death firsthand. This is the good world that he created that is not so good anymore. And yet... See, the story doesn't end there. In the midst of our rebellion, God still chooses to draw near to us. Even in that story of Adam and Eve where God calls out from, to them and they hide from him. He still meets them where they're at and then he makes clothes to cover them. And he covers their shame and he makes a way for them to move forward making promises that one day he will still restore this world to the world that he created it to be. He makes a way for us still to this day to come to him. See, Jesus is God in um, God with us in the midst of human brokenness and mess. He did what we could not because he faces the exact same temptations of, as us and yet he is without Sin in Hebrews 4 15 to 16 it says, He was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And then it goes on and it says this it says, Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. See, what Jesus did is he provided the grace needed for us to continue to approach God's throne of grace with confidence. He invites us back into this relationship with God that we were designed to for. A relationship of trust, a relationship of partnership, a relationship of freedom and love. That is what we were designed for. Yes, we have lost our innocence. Yes, we see brokenness and heartache and pain and death and those are all the consequences of our rejection and rebellion against God, but that is not the end of the story. Because in the midst of it all, God continues to walk with us and continues to guide us. But he still gives us choice. In the very last book, so we started at the very first book of the Bible. If you go to the very last book of the Bible, the book of Revelations, in Revelations 3 verse 20, it says this. This is God speaking and he says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door... I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. See, generation after generation, they have felt the effects and the weight of this reality. Of our choices that have created the separation between us and God. And yet there are generations that, um, that speak of the wisdom of trusting in God. And as I mentioned last week, the book of Proverbs is imagine a, son's, a father sorry, sitting down with his son. 
And the father saying, son, let me teach you the way to live in this world. Let me show you the things that I have learnt. And then at the very foundation of this book, it's, it says this in Proverbs 3, 5 to 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. Many of us will know that verse. We've heard that wisdom before. It's the wisdom that we were not designed to define right and wrong for ourselves, but we were created to trust our God, the creator and author of life. When it comes to navigating this world and this journey, it's not doing it on our own, but it's trusting in God. True wisdom is recognizing our inability to live in this world without God. The author of life, creator of this world, the one who breathes his breath of life within us. He alone knows the way forward. We were never designed to navigate this world on our own. And so if we want to live in this world and live well, we need to learn from the wise and build a foundation that comes from that place of trusting in the Lord God above everything else. And so we're going to briefly look at what does it mean to trust the Lord your God with all of your heart? The word trust means to depend upon or to believe. In dictionary.com, it says it's a reliance on the integrity, strength, ability, surety, etc. of a personal thing. It's to have confidence in something or someone. Adam and Eve failed to trust God when he spoke. They listened to the lies of the enemy rather than the, lie, the, than the voice of God. They questioned, did God really say? Now notice that this is the same tactic that the enemy uses against Jesus when he first starts his ministry. In Matthew 4 verse 3, it says, The tempter came to him, who is Jesus, and said, If you really are the Son of God, He does exactly the same thing to Jesus. He starts questioning Jesus' identity and he uses the same tactics on us all the time. Are you really who God say you are? If you really are loved by God, why does all this bad stuff happen? If you really were forgiven, why then? It is lie after lie that tries to make us not trust that God really has spoken these things over us. And in the Bible, it warns us of this. It says that that the enemy is a liar. He is the father of lies. It says that he is the thief that comes to steal, kill and destroy. That he is our accuser, the one that tries to condemn us. But the good news is, is that Jesus is the one that intercedes on our behalf. He stands on our behalf, recognizing our frailties, knowing every sin that we've committed, knowing the worst of human evil and human cruelty. And yet he stands on our behalf and he intercedes for us. See, where the devil would bring condemnation, Jesus might bring conviction or he does bring conviction, but he also brings freedom. And you might ask, what's the difference between condemnation and conviction? Well, condemnation says that God has rejected you. It brings shame and fear and results in us running and hiding from God and rejecting his love. Whereas conviction comes from the father heart of God, from a place of love that is there to restore and to protect, to transform and to bring light to the lies and to restore us into the relationship with God that we were designed and the freedom that we were designed for. Jesus didn't come to to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. John uh, John 3, 17. And this is the incredible thing about the biblical story is that God doesn't reject us in our shame and brokenness, but he recognizes, the Bible recognizes that we are the ones responsible for the sin and the pain in our world that God never designed it that way, but we chose to rebel against him and those were the consequences. And yet, despite our rebellion, God does not leave us there. He doesn't give us what our sins deserve, but he continues to love us and to offer us safety in the midst of our broken world. 
It means that in the midst of the mess and in the pain, in the shame, we can hold on to God's promise that he is with us. We can trust God to be faithful in that promise. When I was doing a word study on this word trust and I was looking at everywhere in the Bible that it spoke about trust, what I noticed in the Psalms is that the word trust and refuge are used interchangeably. Um, And so I looked into the word refuge and the word refuge was first used in the Bible as a city of safety. It was the cities that God had designed that people who um, had accidentally killed someone, they had a place to run to in order to get a fair trial. And now this wasn't a time to walk casually. It was a time that they would run to safety. It was the city of refuge to which they would run to. Other ways that the word refuge is used is for a high impenetrable tower. I don't know if I said that word right. Um, High tower against the enemy or a place of shelter from a storm. So regardless of how this word refuge is used, it's always a place of safety. And so when we trust in God, we can trust that he is our place of safety, our place to go through in the midst of the mess, in the midst of the brokenness. In Psalm 91 verse 2, it's just one example of how this word is used. It says, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Or the message version says it this way, God, you're my refuge. I trust in you and I am safe. It is because God is our strength and our shield and our refuge that we can trust in him. But how we trust in him is with all of our heart. So trust in the Lord your God with all of your heart. Now this phrase is um, with all your heart means wholeheartedly or single-mindedly. In some translations it says trust in the Lord completely. And it speaks about the comprehensive nature of trust. And that you trust in the Lord completely with everything, with all your heart. But this proverb also talks about the exclusive nature that we trust God. It's not just when we understand. It's not just when it makes sense. And then the exhaustive nature of our trust in all of your ways. And so this trust in God is a complete trust And it's more than just an emotional response. When we often think, I love you with all my heart, we think of emotions. But all you need to do is read 1 Corinthians 13 to realize that love is so much more than just an emotional response. And it's the same thing with trust. In fact, this metaphor within Hebrew is it speaks about um, when it talks about all of your heart, it speaks about the seed of your emotions, but also your mind, your will, and even your whole person. It's, it's when you speak about um, trust the Lord your God or love the Lord your God with all your heart. It, it's with the emotional response, but also with one's thinking or perspective. And you see an example of this in Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. God gives this command to love the Lord with your God with all your heart, soul and mind. Now Jesus quotes this in his ministry in three of the Gospels when they, when they quote Jesus on this. They include the word mind. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength. Now, they weren't just, Jesus didn't change it and add mind in, but rather it was a reflection of what the Hebrew metaphor actually meant. That when you trust the Lord your God with all your heart, love the Lord your God with all your heart, it's also a mind and will connection as well. And we recognize this throughout the Bible that when it comes to trusting God, this is not just a feeling, but it is a choice. A choice of mind and will to put your trust in God no matter how things seem. Even when you don't understand, it's the choice to believe what God has said. To believe that God is who he said that he is and to believe that we are who God says that we are. It's a choice to believe that God is faithful in the midst of the mess When the story hasn't finished yet and you don't know the end that is coming, it's to trust that God is faithful. It's to run to him as our refuge and our fortress, our place of safety in the midst of our broken and hurting world. Trust in the Lord your God with all your mind, will and emotions. It's complete surrender. All of us face the results of a broken and hurting world. 
where mankind's fight against God and each other for control, for power. And none of us are going to escape this world without the pain and heartache and suffering that comes with it. But know that that was never God's design and know that it's not the end of the story. So if we want to be people who live well in this life, then we need to learn from the wise and build a foundation for our foundation on trusting the Lord God completely. Trust him when he speaks. Don't believe the lies of the enemy that would make you doubt God, that would make you doubt you. But trust him when he speaks and trust that he is faithful to fulfill his promises. And trust him completely, not just when you feel like it, but with your mind, with your will, with your choices. Complete surrender. So let's not follow the destructive pattern of the world and trying to seize autonomy for ourselves, thinking that we can do this life without God, without the author, without the creator. I pray that this message will encourage you, will speak hope and life into your heart. That we can know that in the midst of the pain that we can trust God and that is the foundation for navigating the journey ahead when we have never been this way before. Let me pray for us. Father God, I thank you for the truth that your word brings. I thank you God that your word speaks life and speaks hope. That your word reminds us who you are. And it also reminds us of who we are. It reminds us, God, that you have not rejected us in the midst of this mess. And God, that you continue to draw near to us as we draw near to you. And so, Father God, I ask in this moment, help us to be people who believe you when you speak. Father God, I just pray that you would be breaking off every lie that we have ever believed Father God, that where there are people listening to this message and they have believed the lies of condemnation, that they are not good enough, that God has rejected them, that there is no hope for their future. I just break off those lies now in Jesus' name. And Father God, I pray that you would replace those lies with your truth, with your conviction, but also with your love and your grace. God, that they would hear your spirit calling them to return to you, God. Father God, that we would believe you when you speak and that God, you would be the one that we run to in the midst of the struggles and the trials of life. God, that we would find our safety and our hope and our freedom within you again. I thank you, God, that you have, you have, um, that through Jesus, we are restored in our relationship with you. Help us to know what you are saying and speaking and God, give us hearts that believe. I pray these things in the mighty and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. I don't know um, every person, obviously, that is going to be watching this video. Um, but I do want to encourage you in this. Whoever you are, whatever your story, no matter what you have done, no matter the questions you have or what you have believed about yourself or about God, can I tell you that God's promise is that he will draw near to you, that he is calling your name and he is inviting you to follow him, to believe him, to be restored in your relationship with him. Today you have heard the good news about who Jesus is. You've heard the story about where sin and brokenness and death has come from and where it's got us. But also that that's not the end of the story, that Jesus came to give life and life to the full. In John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And it goes on from there and it says, For his, he did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Can I tell you that he did not come to condemn you? But he came to speak hope and life and to restore you to the relationship with Father God that you were designed for and to bring you back to a life of freedom, of partnering with God in this world. And so I simply want to invite you to make this decision to put your trust in him. 
And if you do make that decision today, we would love to do this journey of faith with you. Here at Fuel, we don't believe that church is a spectator sport where you just log on, watch a service and and carry on with your day. But church is the body of people who profess to believing in Jesus and, and are seeking to follow him with our entire lives. Together we do this journey of learning what it means to be a follower of Jesus and we invite you to come on this journey with us. And so there are plenty of ways that you can connect with us. There's going to be a link in the um, in the service tab now. You can jump onto our website and find out more about how to connect with us. But can I encourage you, don't try and do this journey on your own. We were never designed to do this faith journey in isolation.